thank you for the invitation. It's really uh, wonderful to be here virtually. And uh, I join you in hoping that one day I can visit your beautiful institute. Now, I have some slides that I'd like to share. And uh, it looks to me as if you're now able to see my slides. If that's not the case, um, I hope yes, someone can tell me right away. OK, that's great. So um, I'm going to speak about a topic uh, that uh, I've long studied and talk about recent results on this topic. The general topic is the arithmetic of modular curves and their Jacobians. And of course, um, with uh, that topic is the arithmetic of modular forms. And uh, I prepared these uh, slides that I think are um, pretty good. And if you'd like copies, please email me and I'll send you a copy of the slides. Uh, I hope that uh, my having had dinner just now with uh, a little bit of wine will not prevent me from trying to describe these in some coherent fashion. So we are interested in a very special case of classical modular forms, holomorphic modular forms. So, you know, I've long studied the uh, group gamma zero of N, subgroup of SL2Z consisting of matrices that are upper triangular modulo N. Uh, they act on the upper half plane. Uh, you get a quotient and the differentials on the quotient are uh, the modular forms of weight two for gamma zero of N. Uh, there's a subspace consisting of forms that uh, are uh, well behaved at the cusps, vanish at the cusps. These are the cusp forms. And there's a complementary direct sum end, the space of Eisenstein series. And um, these three spaces have uh, the action of HECA operators, T sub n, for every n uh, greater than or equal to one positive integers. And in particular, um, for example, I might have a prime number q. Um, and let's suppose that q divides n then in uh, the operators that I consider, I consider what uh, Hecke uh, called TQ, um, Atkin and Lehner call it UQ, but I do not consider the operator WQ, which also appears in the atkin lehner theory that many authors have decided to substitute for UQ when making rings of Hecke operators. So I can take the ring generated by all the heck operators. And of course, if I just write something like Z adjoined T1 up through, et cetera, uh, it, it looks as if I'm discussing a formal polynomial ring, but I'm actually taking the quotient of the formal polynomial ring that is cut out by the three different spaces, the space of modular forms, the space of cusp forms, and the space of Eisenstein series. Um, these are free Z modules whose ranks are the dimensions of the corresponding spaces. There's a duality between heck operators and modular forms that is uh, well described in Shimura's book on the arithmetic of modular forms, for example. And um, in particular, the rank of the ring of heck operators acting on the full space of modular forms is the sum of the ranks of the uh, corresponding Hecker rings on the spaces of cusp forms and Eisenstein series. And these two latter rings are quotients of the big Hecker ring. And uh, therefore you have maps from T to um, T sub S and to T sub E. And when you assemble them, you get a map from T to the product of these two rings. And this is actually an injection because a Hecker operator that is zero both on S and on E is zero on their direct sum, which is the space M. So the operator is literally zero. And because the ranks on the same side, on the two sides are equal, the sum of the ranks of TS and TE is equal to the rank of T, the co-kernel is just a finite abelian group. And the fact that the co-kernel um, tends to be non-zero is um, one of the interesting facets of the theory of the arithmetical theory 
of modular forms. And in particular, um, this um, deficiency, the fact that T is actually smaller than the product was studied very, very carefully uh, in the special case when the level is a prime number by Barry Mazur in an article that was published around 1977. The journal has 1977 written as its publication date, although the author claims that actually um, the paper appeared before. Uh, and um, there, there's really very subtle information about modular forms that is contained in this kind of landmark paper, paper and the perspective and the questions from this paper have um, really percolated uh, through a lot of the uh, subsequent work in this area. So um, in particular, uh, Barry Mazur's paper is called Modular Curves and the Eisenstein Ideal. And one way to define the Eisenstein ideal of the Hecker ring is to take the kernel of the uh, projection or restriction map from the Hecker ring on the full space to the Hecker ring on Eisenstein series. So the Eisenstein ideal consists of Hecker operators that are zero on uh, Eisenstein series. And then you have um, T mod I isomorphic to the Eisenstein ring. And um, if you think of T as being uh, inside the product of its two projections, then I can be viewed as the intersection of T with TS um, cross zero. It's the things that are zero in the second factor so I can be thought of as living inside the first factor. <clears throat> and in particular, if you project the Eisenstein ideal that I've just defined onto the first factor, what you get is the Eisenstein ideal inside the ring of Hecke operators acting on cusp forms. That's the ring considered by Maser, and you get Maser's Eisenstein ideal, at least in the case of prime level. But um, one thing that I've tried to do in this talk is to think that the kind of major object is the full ring T and to think of I inside T and try to avoid discussing what happens in the first of the two factors. Let everything live in the big product. Okay. And now what happens is that there are maximal ideals of T that um, come under discussion and there's kind of an epithet primes of T. The primes are T of T are just the same thing as the maximal ideals. And if you have a prime uh, coming from TE, in other words, a maximal ideal of um, TE, you get a maximal ideal of the full ring, which uh, if I call this M bar or something, it's uh, kind of P2 inverse of M bar. Um, if you think of the map from T to TE as the second projection. So in other words, you're just pulling the maximal ideal of TE back to a maximal ideal of T and you get a maximal ideal of T that could be called Eisenstein. And uh, these are also, by the way, the maximal ideals that contain the Eisenstein ideal that I've just defined. And similarly, analogously, you could take maximal ideals of TS, pull them back to T, and get cuspidal maximal ideals. And um, in the larger scheme of things, these two ideals kind of live on separate planets. There's no interaction between them. But a very interesting thing happens when you have a maximal ideal of T that comes both from the cuspidal space and from the Eisenstein space, uh, those primes are called primes of fusion in Mazur's language. And um, roughly speaking, they correspond to congruences mod some prime number, the residue characteristic of the maximal ideal between Eisenstein series and cusp forms. If you have 
a maximal ideal of T, there's an associated two-dimensional representation of the Galois group of Q with values in GL2 of a finite field, namely the residue field of M. And this uh, representation is characterized up to isomorphism by the requirement that it be semi-simple and continuous. And uh, we can add the fact that its determinant should be the mod P cyclotomic character. So P is the residue characteristic of M pretty systematically. And um, the main thing that everybody remembers is that this uh, representation is unramified outside the primes P and the prime divisors of N. And if you take a Frobenius element for such a prime, call it Q, then the image of the representation is a matrix whose trace is equal to the Qth Hecke operator considered mod M. And it's almost tautological that if M is Eisenstein, then this rho M bar is uh, reducible. It's uh, the direct sum of the trivial character and the mod P cyclotomic character. And um, I probably say that in some neat way, uh, two or three slides from now, but that's an important thing to, um, to talk about. And just to set the stage, I say a little bit more about how we know this. If M is cuspidal, that's kind of the opposite of Eisenstein, then this rho M bar is usually irreducible, kind of generically irreducible, but it turns out that it's reducible if and only if it uh, is uh, coming from an Eisenstein situation and the representation looks like the representation that I've just circled. In other words, um, the primes M of T whose Galois representations are reducible are exactly the, uh, I'm sorry, the, the cuspidal primes whose Galois representations are reducible are exactly the primes of fusion. Now on this slide, I say a little bit about um, Mazur's world that um, I think most of you are uh, at least vaguely familiar with. So um, one thing to remember is that the way that I've defined uh, Eisenstein primes in this talk means that there are quite a lot of them. So in Mazur's world, you have T, um, it maps on to the cuspidal ring that is, you know, the thing that Mazur actually studies. And it also maps on to the Eisenstein ring, which is just the ring of integers. The space of Eisenstein series is one dimensional in that case. And so every time you have a prime number, you can take the ideal that it generates in Z and pull it back to T and you get an Eisenstein prime of T. And the question is, when does that Eisenstein prime represent an ideal of fusion? When does it come also from the space of cusp forms? And this is what Mazur explains. Um, there's a condition, there are only finitely many primes P for which this is the case. And these are exactly the primes that divide the numerator of the fraction n minus one over 12, um, n being the level, being a prime number. So for example, if n is 11, n minus one is 10, and the numerator of that fraction is five, that's a famous example. And if n is 23, then n minus one is tw uh, 22, and the numerator is 11. Um, and the Eisenstein primes of the cuspidal ring correspond to the ideals of fusion. And as I've just said, these correspond to the prime numbers that divide this easily calculated numerator. So that's Mazur's world. And now um, I can uh, say a little bit more about the reducible case. I did say something um, as a known fact that if uh, the representation is reducible, then the ideal, uh, the maximal ideal that gives rise to it is actually Eisenstein. 
So this is something that is not completely obvious. And in fact, um, if you think about it, it, it seems to be so, such a compelling fact that um, you worry that you're missing something if you think it's not obvious. And then you say, oh my God, how do I prove it? And um, the uh, written proof is in an article by Hua Zhang Yu, um, who will be speaking three days from now in the same time slot. And he told me earlier today that this appears in one of his articles. So um, what this means, and, and this really comes down to the theme of this whole talk, is that um, by um, various things like the Brouwer-Nesbitt theorem and the Chevator of density theorem and some local study of representations, you'll find out very quickly that if rho m is reducible, this implies that one plus q minus tq belongs to m for all primes q not dividing p times the level. Um, so um, if, if somehow if um, rho bar m comes from a cusp form mod p, um, mod p means mod some maximal ideal in a ring of integers um, whose residue characteristic is p, um, maybe this cusp form is f. What this uh, is basically telling you is that if you take the qth coefficient of f, this is congruent to one plus q um, mod m or mod p, I guess mod p, I should say, some Gothic prime, for all these primes not dividing pn, but this doesn't really nail for you the fact that the cusp form is congruent to a genuine Eisenstein series because you have a congruence that as far as Euler factors are concerned, um, omits all the factors for primes that do divide p times n. And there's also no um, reference to anything involving potentially the constant term of the Eisenstein series. Although that comes for free by the Q expansion principle. But all I'm saying is that um, if you try to relate reducible representations to congruences between Eisenstein series and cusp forms, it looks like it's going to be um, not too difficult, but you really have to nail down the particular Eisenstein series that's going to appear show that it really exists and show that you have a genuine congruence term by term relating the cusp form and the Eisenstein series. And um, I, I do wanna talk a little bit briefly about Eisenstein series. So um, there are these cusps, if you take you know, X zero of N, which is the modular curve attached to uh, gamma zero of N, this is some y0 of n, which is the quotient of the upper half plane by the, um, by the congruent subgroup. And then there are uh, points that you add on to compactify the thing, which are called the cusps. And the cusps are in one-to-one -one correspondence with the divisors of the uh, number n. And as uh, you may have noticed when I started, I said that n was gonna be square free. So if you want to introduce some notation that I'd prefer to avoid, um, n is gonna be a product of uh, new different prime numbers, L. I'd much prefer to say L divides n, and there are new of them. And the cusps are in one-to-one -one correspondence with the divisors of this product. So the number of divisors is two to the power nu. And um, if we were working in higher weight, somehow we'd immediately infer that the space of Eisenstein series had uh, dimension equal to two to the power nu. But the problem is that the kind of level one Eisenstein series that uh, I've written down, I think, I hope correctly with the 24, um, that looks like the kind of Eisenstein series you'd study if you study the modular form delta of uh, weight 12 in Sayre's book, um, Course in Arithmetic. 
Um, it looks like that. It's the weight two version, but the problem is that it doesn't exist. There's actually no holomorphic modular form with this property. And the um, eigenforms in the space that we're discussing, the space of module of eigen, Eisenstein series of this weight and level, all arise by formal level raising from this fake Eisenstein series of level one. And um, after you've raised the level to all the different divisors of N, you have to throw away the original <laughs> Um, Eisenstein series that corresponds, if you like, to the divisor one of N, uh, and that goes away. So the dimension is one less than you might imagine. But other than that, um, the Eisenstein series are pretty well behaved. And the main thing is that you have in this uh, space, you have some kind of basis. Um, this notation will probably haunt me forever. Um, call the basis elements G, then what happens is that if you hit G with one of the HEC operators T sub L, where L divides N, go back to a better notation, what you get is either G itself or L times G. In other words, the eigenvalue is one or L. And um, for every L, you get to choose between one and L. So there are two choices. And the choice that is not allowed is where um, G hit by TL is L times G for all L. In other words, when you make the spaces, at least one of the choices has to be one as opposed to L. So this is one times G. So this is a space that's uh, completely explicit. And in fact, um, if you take the ring generated by the HECA operators on the space, this ring, which is some quotient of polynomial ring, is also completely explicit. And I could write down with my stylus what it is, except that uh, I actually tell you what the relations are. So you take the um, polynomial ring generated by these new different um, operators. The U sub L is a synonym for um, T sub L. And then you impose the relations. And the relation is that um, on every uh, basis vector, UL has to operate either as one or L, and at least one of the ULs has to operate as one. And so this product is equal to zero um, when you take a product over all L uh, and in the line above, UL minus one times UL minus L is supposed to be zero for each L dividing N. And, and that's all the Eisenstein ring is. Um, you certainly know that this ring operates on space of Eisenstein series through the remarks that I just made. And you also know that uh, the image T sub E is supposed to have rank over z equal to two to the new minus one. And so what else could it be? You can't divide by anything further and preserve the rank. And so um, te is really just um, the polynomial ring divided by the relations that I have listed. So it's a, it's a very nice and a very friendly algebra. Um, I do wanna say something here which is that the T itself is kind of mysterious and kind of wild. Um, and um, it's commutative, it's a commutative ring. And you could take T tensor Q, and this is a Q algebra, and you can ask whether or not it is semi-simple. Is it just a product of fields? And the answer is yes, and this is a theorem of Coleman and Edixhoven, where um, I give the reference later on in these slides. Not, not a hard article to find once you know the two authors. I think it's the only article that they wrote together, but that gives you a little bit of perspective on this Hecker ring that it is you know, not, not as uh, awful <laughs> as you might imagine. 
And I, I do want to say that in the 1970s, when Mazur started studying the ring T sub S, when N is a prime number, he started asking questions uh, about the commutative algebra aspects of these Hecker rings. And he was really the first person to do that. You know, he asked questions like, take this ring, is it Gorenstein? Um, you know, how far is it from being integrally closed in the product of the number fields that you get by taking t tensor q? Uh, and, and these are very interesting questions. Uh, and before Mazur, the people who, who worked in the subject, whom I won't name, uh, were very happy saying, well, we have this ring that operates and it's not quite a product but we're going to make some little isogeny and make the product operate. And then things just blast apart um, in some very predictable way. So uh, you gain something when you do that, you get ease of manipulation, but you lose something big because you've lost contact with the original object. So um, keep that in mind if uh, that you, there's something that you want to retain from this talk. And now here's at least the title of the Coleman Edix Hoven paper. And um, a little bit more about um, piatic completion. If you complete the ring T, any one of these rings piatically, um, that's the same thing as tensoring over Z with uh, the ring of piatic integers. And you get something that's semi-local. The thing just kind of breaks apart as a product of local rings. Namely, you get the product over the maximal ideals whose residue characteristics are P uh, of the completion of the ring that you're studying at the maximal ideal. And this was um, kind of studied uh, and taken note of by Mazur in his paper. And, and so the idea is that the T sub M um, is, is not a product. If you take TM tensor with QP, what you're going to get is some product of piatic fields. The T itself will be in the product of the integer rings of these piatic fields, but it's really an order. I mean, it's not the product of the integer rings. Um, first of all, in, if you project down to any particular integer ring, um, even pianically, you, you might not get the whole thing. Now I'm worried. But um, if you look at the product, it's not the product of its projections. And, and this somehow uh, reflects the fact that when you take different uh, eigenforms, they can be congruent to each other um, and fused at the prime M. Now, why do I care about all this stuff? So that's a good thing. So I said in the beginning that I was going to talk about modular curves and their Jacobians. And there is the modular curve X0 of N that I told you about a few minutes ago. So this is a, an algebraic curve um, over Q, in fact, of some genus G. Um, and um, if you take the Jacobian of this curve, then you get an abelian variety uh, of dimension G, so you get something that's an algebraic group, which makes it good to um, work with. And um, as Shimura teaches us in his book, Arithmetic of Modular Forms, the HECA operators that were defined initially as just acting on spaces of forms um, act as correspondences on the curve. And then by pullback or push forward, depending on how you want to construct the Jacobian, they act as endomorphisms on the Jacobian. And um, therefore, they're elements of the endomorphism ring of J0 of N. And in fact, um, what happens is that the ring of Hecke operators, say the big ring T, acts on the Jacobian through the very same quotient on, on which it acts on the space of cusp forms. And, and there's a direct connection. If you take the uh, tangent space at the identity of the Jacobian, you get the linear dual of the space of cusp forms or the space of cusp forms, depending on 
how you make the Jacobian. And um, so it's good to involve the algebraic geometry. And if you want to have uh, not just the space of cus forms, but the full space of modular forms, then there's an analog where you replace J0 of n by a generalized Jacobian, which is an extension of J0 of n by a torus whose uh, character group is the group of degree zero divisors on the algebraic curve that are concentrated on the set of cusps. Um, but in, in this talk, I say tonight and this morning, because for me, it's still Sunday night. Um, I, I will not talk about this generalized Jacobian, but some of you have worked on it and know that it's an interesting object. Okay. Now, um, what's amazing is that um, a, a lot of people have worked on the, the arithmetic of these Jacobians and, and doing computations with um, the Jacobians. And in particular, there was William Stein who founded uh, a software package called Sage, which uh, is, is best located by its uh, domain name, sagemath.org. And using Sage, you can compute all sorts of things on the Jacobian um, for very large classes of n. And in particular, so I should explain this a, a little bit. Um, if, if you take the Jacobian J0 of n, you can think of it as the Albanese variety of X0 of n which is to say that you can think of it as classes of divisors of degree zero on the modular curve. And among the classes of, uh, among the divisors of degree zero, you have what I'll, I call C tilde, which is the group of degree zero divisors concentrated on the cusps. This is exactly the group that I mentioned, you know, 90 seconds ago. It's the group who's uh, the corresponds to the torus that occurs in J0 of n tilde. Um, but these are divisors on the curve. And so you get a um, quotient of this sitting inside um, J0 of n. So this consists of classes of divisors of degree zero that are concentrated on the cusp. And this thing is called the cuspidal subgroup of J0 of n. And the cuspidal subgroup has been studied at least um, in the work, uh, at least beginning in the work of my colleague, Berkeley colleague, Andrew Ogg, who computed the cuspidal group uh, in the case of prime level, for example. And um, he conjectured that this cuspidal group was the full group of uh, torsion points defined over the rational number field in J0 of n if n is prime. So this was called Ogg's conjecture. And it was proved by Mazur. It's one of um, a cluster of outstanding conjectures that were proved by Mazur in his article and um, Stein realized that it would be interesting to compute this group in cases where n is not prime. And one thing he discovered is that um, if you um, do calculations when n is square free, uh, I said I was going to talk about square free n then the cuspidal group is, is actually rational. All the cusps are defined over Q. That word that I'm scrolling is supposed to say rational. Let me try to make it um, a little bit more legible. Um, Stein realized in computing that the group of rational points, torsion points of J0 of n for um, n square free coincided with the cuspidal um, group. And so he started telling people about this and this became either Stein's conjecture or folklore conjecture or 
um, the generalized Augs conjecture, depending on what terminology you want to use. And um, I was reminded earlier today by Hua Zhang Yu that um, Ota, Masao, is his name, Ota, um, proved this conjecture um, up to some primary parts that were hard to analyze um, in the case when n is square free. And in his result and also other results in the literature, um, my take on things, which may not be everybody's take, is that the way you prove the conjecture is somehow you analyze both sides very, very carefully and you observe that you get the same answer in the two cases. So the two things are equal because somehow you get the same answer when you do separate computations. And so I have been somehow promoting the idea that there, there might be more conceptual methods that um, could be brought to bear on such conjectures where you somehow prove the two things are equal um, as Mazur used to say, by pure thought, without ever finding out what they're actually equal to. So, so that, that's kind of the idea. And um, my motivation in choosing this topic was to promote this idea in the case when n is square free. But I, I also wanna say in passing that if n is no longer necessarily square free, um, there has been quite a bit of work in this uh, subject by you and um, uh, co-authors, let's say that. Um, so it's no longer true that C is um, rational. So you have to throw that out, but you can take the subgroup of C consisting of those points that are rational, and you can compare that with the group of torsion points of J0 of N that are rational. And again, um, Stein discovered in computing that you get the same thing. <laughs> it's, it's kind of no more torsion points than the ones that you could um, explain by um, looking at the cuspidal group. And you will tell us um, if you think today is Monday, uh, then on Thursday, or for me on Wednesday night, um, what progress has been made recently in this direction for n not necessarily square free. So here on these slides, I say that there was Og and Mazur and Stein, and I think I've told you that story already. And now we're gonna have a brief pause, you know, like when I, I lecture at Berkeley, I try to um, say, okay, we're gonna have a, a little tiny break in the middle of the lecture to just refresh things and move on to the next subject. And so I present to you a photo of the bread that I baked this morning while I was preparing uh, these slides. Okay, um, so now here is, is a way that I think might be fruitful to think about Stein's conjecture. So um, one thing that uh, we should really say is that if you take if you take the cuspidal group inside of J0 of N, that this is what I would call, and Mazur has called, a module of fusion for um, the cuspidal algebra and the Eisenstein algebra. What this means is the following. So if I take um, the big Tecker ring E, a T, and I make it operate on this porous cuspidal subgroup, which is uh, in fact invariant under HECA operators. Well, T um, operates through its quotient, T sub S, because um, C is contained in the Jacobian, which is cuspidal. Um, on the other hand, um, if I think of T tilde, for example, uh, C tilde, this group of formal, uh, the formal cuspidal group is what I call it, consisting of divisors of degree zero with support on the cusps. And I ask myself how T operates on um, this group. Well, it actually operates through its Eisenstein quotient. 
And, and that's because um, the, the cusps are kind of intrinsically Eisensteinian to um, coin a phrase. And so to say that C is a modular fusion is to say that the big HECA operator acts on C through both of its quotients, TS and TE. And what that tells you in particular is that if you have a maximal ideal of T in the support of C, then that's a prime of fusion. It comes both from TS and from TE. So the cuspidal group generates congruences. That's uh, kind of its thing. And um, in particular, um, to say that um, C is equal to J0 of N Q torsion is to say that this latter group is also a module of fusion. And since it's already um, cuspidal, it kind of T operates uh, on it through the quotient T sub S, to say that it's a module of fusion is to say that it's also operating through the quotient TE, which is to say that the Eisenstein ideal I is operating trivially on this uh, right-hand group. And so we could formulate that as a conjectural statement um, if you believe that this equality is, is a question, although it, it has um, more or less been resolved. Um, you could reformulate, you could write down the consequence of that equality by saying that the module J0 of NQ tors is um, a module of fusion, or alternatively, um, is, is an Eisenstein module. And what I am trying to tell you is that um, conversely, and maybe this word also should be conversely, um, if you know somehow that J0 of N Q tors, that's quite a mouthful, is contained in the kernel of the Eisenstein ideal on J0 of N, then you're in pretty good shape because there has been so much study of this kernel um, by a number of authors of which I am one, um, that if, if you knew this apparently weaker statement, you could recover the full statement that this uh, torsion subgroup is uh, the cuspidal group on the nose, okay? So knowing that the thing is Eisenstein um, will we'll tell you with um, some work that I consider kind of conceptual that um, you're, it's actually the same thing as the cuspidal group. And the point is that if you take any group of torsion points that's rational, so what this means being rational is that the Frobenius for a, a random prime number Q is equal to one on this module. But there's also an eichler shimura relation that relates the Hecke operator to uh, Frobenius in these actions. And so if the Frobenius is acting as one, then the Hecke operator is acting as one plus Q. And so one way to say that is that one plus Q minus the HECA operator, or if you prefer the HECA operator minus one minus Q is zero on the module, um, which is to say that the module is annihilated by one plus Q minus TQ. And the point is that this one plus Q minus TQ is in the Eisenstein ideal um, because on Eisenstein series, TQ operates as one plus Q and you could ask, um, this is kind of the question. Um, here we are at the bottom of the slide. This suggests the question. Um, is it true that you can show that a module is annihilated by the Eisenstein ideal, the full Eisenstein ideal, if you know that it's annihilated by these one plus Q minus TQ? For what Q? Well, Q, you know, not dividing the level, and not dividing the primes that appear in the order of the module. We don't know the order of the module a priori, but it's finite. So we could say for almost all Q, that would be kind of a way to save ourselves. 
And then we could ask, um, is the Eisenstein ideal generated by um, these differences that I call eta sub q, that's Mazur's notation from 1977, is the Eisenstein ideal actually generated by these elements for all but finitely many primes q? If it were, then um, that would be a lot. And the, the thing, the reason that this question is, is kind of audacious in a way is that we, we saw before that the Eisenstein ideal contains things like U L minus L times U L minus one for L dividing N. These are kind of the completely opposite kind of primes from the primes Q that I was just talking about. And there's some further relation, you know, kind of icing on the cake that the product of U L minus one is, is also zero on Eisenstein series when L runs over the uh, set of primes dividing N. So these relations, these, these are certainly extra looking relations. And you could ask, you know, this is why it's audacious. If you have an ideal that contains these eta Qs, does it also contain these relations involving L, L being a different sort of prime from Q. Um, but, you know, I, I was kind of wishing this to be true. And um, at some point um, in the pre-COVID days when I could actually walk into my office and people would come from faraway places and visit Berkeley and talk to me in my office, I had a conversation with Preston Wake, who uh, knows a lot about pseudo representations. And um, he almost immediately said, oh yeah, that's going to work. And he kind of outlined some proof on my glass board in uh, this place I used to call my office long ago and um, wrote up the proof on a uh, very short few pieces of paper. And um, basically the idea of this talk is that I wanted to tell you about the result and tell you the main ideas that go behind the proof. Now, of course, there's kind of a lot of different things. I knew I wouldn't be able to fit everything into uh, a small number of slides. And I'll renew my offer for those of you who would like to get copies of the slides to um, write to me after the talk. And I will send you either a link to a URL where you can pick them up or, or the actual slides. Okay, so this is the theorem that um, if you take the ideal generated by these eta sub q, eta sub q is one plus q minus tq for almost all q, q um, avoiding some finite set sigma that you can fix in advance. You take the ideal generated by these elements that's sitting inside of i and in fact it's equal to i well, you know, again, we have the same sort of restrictions that you see in a lot of the other articles in the subject. Um, and then you start wondering, you know, maybe, maybe there's a reason for these restrictions. Maybe the thing isn't quite the equality that you would like to uh, hope for. But what um, the argument proves is that um, I is equal to J if you localize at prime numbers that stay away from the level. And also I, I think the prime number two might be problematic. Although not the prime number three, a lot of the um, literature has two times, three times, and three seems to be fine. Okay, so um, what do we wanna do? We wanna compare, um, we wanna prove somehow that J is equal to I locally at all prime numbers. Um, but um, already, you know, I explained that T tensors EP is a product of these completions, the TM. So you can try to prove this locally at M. Um, M is a maximal ideal of T. And M, you know, maybe it shouldn't divide two times N because uh, that, that's where the problem is. So you want to prove that J times TM is the same as I times TM for all of these Ms. And um, one thing that uh, is, is pretty clear is that if you uh, localize or complete at a prime M that doesn't contain the smaller of the two ideals, 
then when you localize, you just get the full ring, um, both for J and for I, and so they, they're equal. So um, this is um, the case. Um, yeah. So, so what does it mean not to contain J? Well, I, I explained this before. This is the statement that um, the representation rho m is uh, containing J means it's reducible. So not containing J means that it's irreducible. And the, the main point um, here is something that I've already said, which is that if you have a maximal ideal containing I, um, it contains J and vice versa. Okay, um, so of course, if it contains I, it contains J because J is contained in I. But if it contains J, that means that the representation rho bar M is reducible and there's a, a genuine congruence with an Eisenstein series. And so the maximal ideal contains I as well. And so th there's kind of no distinction. There, there are um, the, the maximal ideals that contain I, um, where you have work to do. This is the Eisenstein case. And um, that, that's where you should be working. Uh, if you're not in the Eisenstein case, there's absolutely nothing to prove. And the other thing that's true, so you have to be in the Eisenstein case. If you're not in the cuspidal case, which is to say that M is Eisenstein, but not cuspidal, um, what happens then is that J and I are both zero. And again, there's nothing to prove. So in fact, if you wanna prove this theorem, you, you have to prove it for the primes of fusion. That's where you have to work. And um, I, I present kind of a cartoon version of the proof um, to begin with, and then the idea is that you can actually carry out this proof um, after localization at one of these primes that you should take to be a prime of fusion. Otherwise, there's nothing to prove. Okay, so um, what's the cartoon version of the proof? So you have um, a map from T down to TE. This is just the restriction or the projection map. And if I were to take um, T mod I, um, then the map from T mod I to TE that this would induce would be an isomorphism. I is the kernel of the original restriction or projection. Um, I can divide out by something a little bit smaller than I, which is J. And then I get a map like this, which I call alpha. And alpha um, a priori has kernel um, I mod J. And the question is whether the kernel is equal to zero. Um, that's a good question. And what we do is we make kind of a section of this map. So you have to construct an S, which is a map from TE to T mod J. Um, of course, uh, what you want is that the induced map S composed with alpha is just the identity on TE. That's kind of a section of this uh, surjective map. And the other thing that you want is that S should actually be surjective. Okay. And if S is then surjective, um, you do a, a tiny diagram chase, which I explain, um, sort of allude to on the slide, and you'll find out that alpha is injective. If S circle alpha is injective and S is surjective, then alpha is injective. Okay, and now what is this map? Well, um, this is um, kind of basically almost like re um, imagining recasting the statement that you're trying to prove because after all te is just kind of t mod i and um, what you're trying to do as you construct the section is you're basically proving that i is equal to j so that's another way to say it and and what are you trying to do you're trying to show that there's a map 
um, that takes the TN in TE to um, the operator called TN in T mod J. So you want this to be well-defined. And, and then of course the thing will be surjective because T is generated by the T mod J. Um, and having it be well-defined, <laughs> I'm not saying very much with content at the moment, having it be well-defined is really the, again, the statement that I is equal to J. Um, and um, what you're basically trying to show is that um, all of the relations somehow that um, make up T sub E um, are relations that are already in J. Now, um, I think I'm misstating this slightly because when uh, we do this, it's much better to think of T E as being T just to join a finite number of variables mod a finite number of relations, the ones with the ULs that I have already um, described. And, and then you make this diagonal map S in, um, a, again, a fairly uh, visible way. Namely, what you do is you take um, the generators U sub L and you map to uh, the corresponding operators in T modulo J and you have to check that all these relations land in J. So the relations that I listed before that I said, you know, had nothing to do with Q's, the ones involving the L's, you have to show actually come from J. But then if you do things this way, you have uh, another problem to grapple with, which is the surjectivity of the map. So at the top of the slide, I was sketching out some way to um, kind of do this. And remember the slide is called a cartoon version of the proof. Um, if, you, um, if, if you go to the top of the slide, I had all the TNs, all the generators of T. So of course the map is gonna be surjective. In the bottom slide, in the bottom of the slide, you only have a, a finite number of the generators. And so the surjectivity becomes an issue. And um, this is maybe sort of meandering, but um, I, I can make things a little bit more solid. This might be the last shy slide that I'll be able to show, where I just remind you um, what happens in prime level. So in prime level, this uh, T sub E, um, suppose N is equal to, pro to a prime, well, um, what is T sub E? T sub E is T adjoin a single variable modulo a single relation. And you can see this is the same as the ring of integers Z. So of course, um, if I just know in advance that it's Z, I can map Z to T mod J. I don't have any checking to do, but then I have to know that the map is surjective, which it's, uh, not obviously going to be. Um, mod J, um, remember, I, I could think of T as being generated by the operators um, T sub N, where N is prime because of the standard relations telling you how to get a heck operator for an arbitrary positive integer index from the heck operators with prime index. And most of the primes are already taken care of by J. If I take a prime Q where Q is not dividing N and it's not in this finite set, then TQ is just one plus Q. So the map is gonna be um, surjective. Uh, the image will include those TQ, but then, then you have others that are not necessarily in Sigma. And you also have this N well, in the case of prime level, capital N, TN, you know, how do you know where that's going? Um, and kind of the answer of how you do this depends to some extent on uh, which prime Gothic M you've used to localize. Um, but if you just worry about these fusion primes, those are the only ones that count for the reasons that I explained 
a few minutes ago, then you have a kind of systematic explanation where you don't see too many cases. Uh, okay, and so I said this was going to be the last slide. Maybe maybe I should stop there. But um, on subsequent slides, which you can see if if you get a copy of them, I explain how to uncover a, a number of the relations, like um, UL minus L and UL times UL minus one, um, using the arithmetic. And the the basic thing that you have to do is um, make judicious use of the Chebotor of density theorem. So I will say one thing. My time is up, but I, but I I, I do want to um, just say one more thing, which is that um, what we're doing is we're completing at M, and then there is a Galois representation, a Piatic Galois representation, with values in GL2, TM, tensor with QP. So that's a product of Piatic fields. And this Galois representation is kind of on the cuspidal components. It's the one really constructed by Shimura. We don't even have to talk about Deline in weight two. And in the Eisenstein components, it's just the direct sum of one and um, the piatic cyclotomic character. So um, that, that's um, kind of an easy thing to work with. And then the ideal J, it turns out to be the ideal generated by the image of um, the trace of this representation, which by the way is ZM valued, even though the representation is over TM tensor QP, the trace of the representation minus one minus the cyclotomic character. And um, you can use that to, to very good effect. Okay, so I should stop. Thank you very much, Professor Rivet, for this wonderful talk. Thanks a lot. Any questions? Any questions, comments? Okay, so I have a question. So, uh, Preston Wicks work uh, work for the um, non-rational Eisenstein series. So, your work is for rational Eisenstein series, right? And then you can talk about the same thing for non-rational. So where this rho m will not be one direct sum chi, but then psi direct sum uh, psi inverse chi. So the last slide, as you can see. Yeah. So then Preston work uh, is whatever he's doing. Is it going to work in that case also? Well, uh, I, I haven't thought about generalizing it to that case. So that's a, certainly a very good question. But um, I mean, one thing that will naturally occur is you want to use the fact that the Swan character of a piatic representation is the same as, uh, sorry, the Swan conductor is the same as the Swan conductor of its uh, mod P reduction. So, I mean, one, one thing that's going to occur is if you have what I called rho bar M before, um, let's say it's reducible, then it might be an extension of one character by another and you have to have some bound on the conductors of these characters. But you do because you know that the um, conductor of the pianic representation rho m is, um, well, it's basically n, it's the level. Um, or depending on the component, it could be a divisor of the level because of old forms. But you have some control over which Eisenstein series um, you need to work with. And I think you'll probably see that phenomenon in uh, other talks at this conference. Thank you. So any more questions? So Ken, maybe I'll ask a question. So is it, uh, is it conjectured that, so uh, the goal is to prove I equals J, right? Uh, they were, is, is it conjectured to be true always? I equals J? Yes. Well, um, yeah. So it, it, always you mean for n not necessarily square free, or do you or mean n square free in your setting? Yeah. So um, it, it's so natural. I mean, certainly in Mazur's case, i is equal to j. 
that, that I would think that it, it's likely to be true. In, in other words, having these little problems with primes dividing the level and the prime two, um, you know, I'm, I'm not so worried. I would think that careful analysis could get rid of um, those restrictions. Okay, thank you. Okay, so, so you know, I mean, so, so what's the statement? You know, Andre Vey said theorems are proved by people who believe in them. Um, I, I would be optimistic that the thing is true and I would try to prove it. And if I encountered serious uh, obstacles, then I'd say, well, you know, maybe the thing isn't true. Um, you know, maybe we should um, try to examine the thing further, right? I mean, I mean you know, and, and another kind of phenomenon that comes to mind that I mention often in, in talks is this uh, work that I did with um, William Stein and Ahmad Agache, where we're relating uh, the modular degree and the congruence numbers of modular forms. And, you know, we could prove they were equal locally at primes whose squares didn't divide the level. And so you could say, well, you know, what about the primes whose squares do divide the level? Um, maybe you work harder and you, and you prove the same theorem. But um, in that case, um, which I'm making as kind of a fake analogy, um, Stein had already figured out how to compute these numbers. And, you know, he found lots of examples, first being, I think, the level 54, which is divisible by three squared, where there was some divergence between the two numbers that you had to, were trying to prove equal. Okay, so, you know, I mean, there, there are cases where two things are closely related, but they're not always the same. Um, but, but I would start by trying to prove that they were the same. Thank you very much, Bruce. So any more questions? If not, let's thank Professor Rimet. Thank you for uh, thank you for giving the wonderful talk. Thank okay, you. Thank so you. we'll meet you. We'll meet in 20 minutes from now. Uh, Professor Ghati is going to speak. Thank you very much, Professor.